And I hope you've all been fortified by a good lunch because it's not every time you get a chance to visit the other world. But that's where we're going in uh, this lecture. Um, we've already seen uh, how some of that solar imagery uh, from Denmark to Central Europe to, to Southern England seemed to reflect uh, the otherworldly visitation of the sun to the, those darker regions uh, uh, beneath the, the earth. I first encountered this aspect of the other world when I, many years ago, began working at one of the royal sites, uh, Rathcrohan in the west of Ireland. Because as I already mentioned in the introductory lecture, um, Rathcrohan stands apart from Tara and Awanmaka and Navan Fort uh, in that it has an entrance to the other world. It's a site that's particularly prominent in early Irish literature because, um, as, as we've seen, it is the place where the great cattle raid, the Thorn Bokulia, began. And it's also a place that has been visited in the past by various heroes of the Ulster cycle. In the tale Brickroos Feast, for example, the Ulster heroes went from door to door of a great house there and had great feasts there. And it's traditionally believed that the great mound at Rathcrohan, Raw Cruhan in early Irish literature, was this great house of Queen Maeve and her consort, Alal. And it's here in the second recension of the Thorn that I already mentioned that you have that famous pillow talk between Alal and Maeve when their royal bed was prepared for them in Cruachan. Indeed, there's a great description of the royal house that traditionally was placed on this mound in uh, the Thorn Bow Freach, in the Cattle Raid of Freach. And it goes on and on. This was the arrangement of the house, seven beds from the fire to the wall of the house all round. There was a fronting of bronze on each bed, uh, fair varied ornament, rods of bronze on the step of each bed, rods of copper. Actually, it sounds like a health and safety nightmare, but um, <laughs> the house was built of pine, as you see. There was a roof of slates on, uh, outside it and so forth, and so on and so on. This is a grandiose medieval invention of what they thought a royal house in heroic times uh, um, might have looked like. And of course it has inspired all sorts of equally fanciful uh, reconstructions. There's an equally fanciful account of Conqueror's house at Awan Marka, and it's clear that this sort of description might be applied by medieval scribes to any royal house in this uh, early literature. As we know now at Rathcrohan, Geophysical survey tells us otherwise. Uh, the Great Mound, in fact, um, in some respects, was a great mound like that at Navan. Various structures, as we saw, were entombed uh, within it. And of course, around it, magnetic radiometry has re revealed a great wealth of enclosures and other features that are undoubtedly uh, ceremonial uh, rather than secular. And as you can see here, um, it's just worth noting at present that the great mound, which is visible in the center of the geophysical image, is surrounded by a huge 360 meter in diameter enclosure. So once again, as at Tara and at Navan, we have this combination of great mound and huge enclosure. And as you can see also in the gradiometry image at the bottom of this illustration, the great mound and indeed a northern enclosure just to the north of it are approached by sort of parallel lines of palisade trenches that were probably processional avenues. And we'll come back to this point at a, uh, another date. As I said already too, uh, Rathcrohan stands apart in having this entrance to the other world. And this is um, Uina Goth, uh, the Cave of the Cats, situated, as you can see, some distance southwest of the Great Mound that is the focal monument in this complex. Uh, today, uh, this entrance to the other world is a sadly dilapidated monument, as you can see. Those two ranging rods basically mark its present entrance. Um, the present entrance is, in fact, through the roof stones of a collapsed uh, souterrain. And those further stones on the left seem to be the remnants of another souterrain, a completely different one that is not connected to Uy Nagoth uh, itself. Um, the other world has many manifestations in early Irish literature. Uh, it may be an otherworldly mound, a she mound, as we saw in the Boyne Valley, or it may be a land uh, beneath lakes or an island. And it's often represented as a land of peace and uh, plenty. But it has a darker side too, and sometimes a series of malevolent creatures emerge and involve themselves in human affairs. 
uh, Uwe Nagath was described in one text, uh, the Battle of Mama Krama, as Ireland's gate to hell by a, a Christian writer. And it is a good illustration of this more malevolent side of the other world. Now, not surprisingly, most people think that archaeological evidence for the other world is hard to come by. But here we begin to come close to seeing aspects of this um, uh, ancient belief. It, today it's uh, a very muddy and uninspiring uh, site. And indeed, it doesn't inspire terror all today. A number of people here, here have actually been there and seen that and survived. So it is possible to visit it today. One of the first visitors to Uinagoth was the antiquarian Samuel Ferguson, who visited it in 1864. And he left us with this very helpful plan on the top left of the site as he saw it in the, the middle of the 19th century. Uh, it's much the same today as it was then, except that that enclosure that he has so carefully drawn has now been completely uh, destroyed, both by cattle and by the construction of a small road um, to the north of the complex. But this was not a ring fort. It was simply a small embanked enclosure. And it certainly was not a cemetery, as uh, Ferguson thought. The various stones that he illustrates lying about may be the roof stones of one or more other souterrains uh, that exist uh, there, but it's effectively unexplored. We did attempt geophysical survey there, but uh, the, this particular uh, area was unresponsive. The entrance depicted by Ferguson in the lower left um, is actually the same today as it, as it was then. You slide down a muddy slope to enter a man-made souterrain. And on the lintel, um, just above the junction of the present entrance and the souterrain proper, there is a gnome inscription, as you can see, that reads basically the stone of Frech, the son of Mev. Ferguson thought this was a reference to the great queen, and it may well be, even though the name seems to be um, in a masculine form. But what's interesting as far as I'm concerned is the reference to Frech, who may be, who may be the Frech that's mentioned in the tale known as the Thoinbo Frech, the cattle raider Frech, one of the most formidable warriors in uh, legendary uh, Connacht. And we'll come back to Frech in, in a moment. This uh, short section of a souterrain, as you slide down and turn left, um, uh, leads to a, a narrow natural limestone uh, fissure, which in fact is quite unremarkable. Uh, it is essentially featureless, and it has a most of the time, uh, a dreadful and very muddy uh, floor. And it, it extends, as you can see, for some further 37 to 40 metres from the souterrain proper. The plan on the right indicates where the natural souterrain, where the souterrain joins the natural cave. And the ohm stone there, with the name of Freyk on it, is marked in black. It's conceivable that the juncture between the souterrain and the natural cave was an important element in the whole configuration of this uh, strange place. Because at that point, you have a series of steps descending to the muddy floor of the cave. And it is possible, given the nature of the sort of slight plinths on either side, that there was once a wooden trapdoor here that separated the man-made souterrain from the natural cave uh, itself. And as I think many people know, these souterrains um, in Ireland are basically considered to be storage places or possibly refuge places. And they're well dated for the most part of the second half of the first millennium AD 500 to, to 1000. They are part and parcel of the uh, ring fort settlement scene. And, and some also occur on ecclesiastical sites. The presence of a an Ogham stone, and indeed a fragment of a second Ogham st stone um, in Uwe Nagath, however, uh, sets it apart. Uh, these stones inscribed with this ancient script are rare in Connacht. They're more commonly found in the southwest of the country. Altogether, Ogham stones of one sort or another have been found in about 113 uh, souterrains, mainly used as roof stones. 
and it's commonly believed that they were basically taken from someplace and used as sort of handy building materials in the construction of these storage places. Unfortunately, in the 19th century in particular, Ogham hunting was a great um, passion, particularly in the southern counties in Cork, and many of these stones were simply taken without proper record from the souterrains in which they had originally been set. So we have very few details about the original positioning of Ogham stones in souterrains, but in a small number of examples, and I show two other ones here, one from County Antrim and one from County Louth, it's very clear that these stones were deliberately placed at important junctions in these man-made uh, souterrains. Sometimes at a point where you had two elements of the souterrain meeting or perhaps where there was a sudden and important change in uh, height or so, uh, some, some such. So it's clear that they were not used for building purposes alone. Their purpose probably was to serve as talismans of some description with a protective function in these uh, storage places. And of course, the practice of subterranean storage very probably had a, a ritual dimension in early medieval Ireland and indeed at earlier times too. This, you may remember, was a feature of the great um, grain storage pits at uh, the Iron Age Hillfort of Danbury in Hampshire, for example, where offerings were made to the underworld powers to protect the grain stored in the silos uh, there. And we've probably seen, as we've seen, the souterrains attached to passage tombs at Nowth and at Douth probably had this protective function too. They were very deliberate connections to older monuments with supernatural qualities. And the notion that the, the Nowth uh, sites were places of potent magic is, is supported by the presence in the actual chambers of the tombs there of a series of graffiti, um, names and in insular script, and a number of Ogham inscriptions, for the most part found deep inside the tombs, uh, both tombs uh, near the chambers. People obviously entered these monuments to inscribe what are sometimes called cryptic Ogham's um, in the depths of these sort of sacred uh, monuments. Unfortunately, as far as I can tell, the actual inscriptions themselves on the stones don't tell us anything about why they were chosen to be placed in special locations in souterrains um, at places like Owena Goth. But we may have a, a clue here in uh, the name of Freyach, as we'll see. The legends attached to Owena Goth are truly remarkable. Uh, as I said, the cave is especially associated with malevolent creatures. And in that uh, tale, the Battle of uh, Maumukrama, you can see that um, out of it came a swarm of three-headed creatures that laid Ireland waste until Amagan, father of Conal Carnock, fighting alone, destroyed it in the presence of the Ullad. Out of it also uh, came the saffron-coloured bird flock, and they withered up everything in Ireland that their breath touched until the Ullad killed them uh, with their slings. Out of it also came ferocious pigs, as you can see, and they laid waste the land. The war goddess, uh, the Morrigan, is another fearsome creature associated with this famous cave. According to the text, her pleasure was in mustard hosts. These tales of evil birds and destructive pigs and other uh, bizarre creatures are echoes of the cave's links with the powers of chaos. And you might think that having this sort of chaotic entrance to a malevolent underworld within a few hundred metres of a royal settlement was a particularly bad piece of uh, early uh, planning. But, of course, this isn't the real world we're talking about. Um, this juxtapositioning, this literary juxtapositioning of an entrance to the other world and an uh, invented royal settlement is an expression of the sacred and social aspects of the community of ancient Crochen, or Rath Crochen. The, the king represents cosmic order and well-being. Uh, the other world in the cave here represents uh, disorder. And it's interesting to note that when those destructive pigs, for example, that emerge from the cave are finally um, overcome, as it happens by Queen Maeve and her 
husband, Alil. This is a representation, uh, a portrayal of the royal couple exercising their sacral function of protecting the land. So these are what these allusions mean. Um, and the reference to Freyr himself, this is, I said, possibly uh, a reference to the great hero, the Thoinbo Freyr, and it's an important warrior association. And I think the allusion to quite a number of warriors in this particular context uh, is noteworthy. It doesn't happen elsewhere, to the best of my knowledge. Um, uh, in Rick Roos Friest, for example, three heroes, Connell, Lyra, <coughs> and Cúhullan, are tested here by terrifying cats that emerge from the cave. These are the cats that give the cave its name. The warriors, Connell and Lyra, retreat, but naturally enough, the great hero, Cúhullan, stands his ground and kills the beast that attacks him. There's also, of course, uh, that warrior, Amergen that I mentioned, um, he uh, was confronted by the monstrous triple-headed Ellen that wasted air until Amergen, the father of Connell the Victorious, killed it in single combat before all the men of Ulster. Now the association of so many warriors, Freyr, Connell, Lera, Cúhullan and Amergen, and we've yet to meet another warrior um, called Nera, seem to hint at a perhaps a, a related purpose for the cave in some fashion. Uh, Georges Dumézil claimed that a hero's combat with a triple-headed monster is actually, where it occurs in various mythic tales, is a transformation into myth of an ancient warrior initiation rite, in which you may have had a mock combat between warrior and perhaps a, a wooden idol with three heads. And perhaps the tale of triple-headed creatures being killed by Amagen might imply that this cave was once the location of warrior <coughs> initiation uh, rituals. And we do know that, in fact, wooden idols um, were a feature of Iron Age Ireland. Um, in the 19th century, well, in the late 18th century, uh, a wooden idol, admittedly one with four faces or four heads, was found in a bog in County Derry. Unfortunately, uh, it was used as a gatepost and decayed, but we have an, an inch-high sketch of it preserved in the Ordnance Survey letter letters of the middle of the 19th century. And there's another 18th century record of a Tipperary idol, uh, a piece of timber. It was described as of human form and of sufficient size to make a gatepost to which use it was applied. Obviously, gateposts were very useful locations for timber idols in days gone by. But the interesting detail here is we do know they did exist, though none have survived. So perhaps Owina Goth was a place for rites of passage that may have involved some forms of testing. And these could have, besides combat, have involved deprivation and isolation and of course, anthropological studies across the world have demonstrated the real effectiveness of such rites uh, of terror in this process. And the number of legendary warriors associated with this famous cave, I think, does more than hint that perhaps these are memories of this sort of um, activity here in past times. A part of the ritual, in fact, may have involved the introduction of the initiate to the spirits of the warrior dead, and the inscription to Freyk um, may have had a role in this, perhaps prompting vivid recollections of heroic uh, and inspirational warrior exploits. And this sort of subterranean testing of a warrior must inevitably uh, bring to mind those stories attached to St. Patrick's Purgatory in Loch Dargan County, Donegal, where the trials of the night own in medieval Europe uh, were so well known and inspired people like Dante. It's possible, even though the evidence doesn't survive, that perhaps there too, in St. Patrick's Purgatory in Loch Derg, there was another entrance to the other world in times past. There's a very interesting reference in a tale called The Adventures of Nera uh, to the otherworldly portal at Rathcrohan. This is a complex and surreal story um, when Alan and Maeve were celebrating the Feast of Samhain uh, at Crochen, 
the warrior Nerna goes outside and cuts down a captive who's been hung the day before and complains of thirst. He gives him a drink and carries him back to his torture. But on returning to the fort, he finds the other worldly people have emerged from the she and have burnt the court of Crochen and simply left a heap of heads there. But he follows them back into the other world and finds a home and a wife there. His wife in the other world explains to Nera that what he has seen is a vision and that Crochen, Rath Crochen, will actually be destroyed at some stage in the future. And he has to go out from the other world to warn the court at Crochen. And when he asks how he'd convince Alil el Maeve that he's been in the other world, in the she, she tells him in a very telling allusion to the inverted nature of the other world to bring the fruits of summer to the winter world outside. So he leaves the other world to warn Alil and Mev, but eventually he's left in the she and will not come out until the end of the world. Now, the tales we've mentioned reflect the chaos of the other world and indeed the terrors of the eve of Samhain when you know, the boundary between one world and the other is at its most uh, uh, tenuous. It's very likely that the cave had ambivalent functions. Uh, the prophetic elements in the adventures of Nera suggest that there may have been uh, prophet prophetic practices um, undertaken here, something that's well documented as far as caves are concerned in the Greek and Roman world. But it does seem likely that different sorts of cult practices took place here in the past. Divination, divination, oracular activity, and of course, as I said, warrior initiation rituals. These actually may have occurred in Scotland too. Um, Anna Ritchie was one of the first to draw attention to the impractical nature of some of those so-called wells or cellars in the brocks and roundhouses of the west and north. And in particular, the complexity of the stone-built subterranean structures in places such as the Brock of Gurness and Orkney with its steps and chambers. All this seemed to imply that the sites like this were more than just wells or storage places. And I remember she suggested that some ritual usage, perhaps a place associated with a, a water cult or oracular activity, may have taken place here. And this suggestion has gathered, I think, um, remarkable support from those discoveries at Meinhau in Orkney as well. Um, here, uh, a, a glacial mound, a very large one, over 90 metres in diameter, was found to be surrounded by a substantial ditch. And there was little or no evidence of domestic activity there, but a, a very substantial seven meter deep shaft had been dug in this natural hillock. And as you can see, a stone built uh, structure constructed uh, within it uh, and with steps and lateral chambers. This thing descended uh, to a, a strange narrow 90 centimeter deep sort of circular basin-like structure that could have held, held water. But the complex architecture here again suggests that this is something more or other than just a water container. Meinhau, I think, it would seem to be a site of religious importance, and its chamber almost certainly should be considered, in the words of Nick Card and Jane Downs, who studied it, in the context of Iron Age religious interest in water cults in the underworld. The scenario suggested for Uina Goth could well apply here as well. And I think these sites um, perhaps suggest that the prehistoric other world is not as obscure and as archaeologically elusive as uh, one might think. Now, we know there's abundant evidence um, for prehistoric cult practices associated with subterranean activities at different times, not just in Ireland and Scotland and the rest of Britain, but across a, a huge area of northern and western continental Europe as well. So-called ritual shafts, for example, are a case in point. This is a difficult area because some of these shafts, particularly in the Iron Age, uh, may have been primarily wells, and it's not always easy to distinguish a disused well full of rubbish from a site that was essentially a focus for ritual uh, offerings. But even excluding uh, those sites where 
usage as a ritual uh, shaft or well as debated. There are many examples where a purely ritual usage seems undeniable. And just to, to cite two examples, uh, to the south in Kent, for example, at Mill Hill near Deal, uh, a very puzzling shaft um, seems to have been decommissioned in the second century AD and filled with Roman rubbish. This was a very impressive location where there was a Bronze Age barrow, Iron Age burials, uh, later medieval burials, and I'll be coming back to Mill Hill in a, a later lecture. But this subterranean shrine uh, is particularly interesting. It was two and a half meters deep, and um, the floor, if you like, once you descended to the bottom of the shaft, gave access to a sort of a side chamber. It's that protrusion uh, on the left. And the chamber was described as just big enough for five adults to sit in but not stand fully upright. An interesting find in the lower fill was a small chalk carving. And the excavator suggested that it may actually, the carving, have been once situated in a small niche in one of the walls of that side, side chamber. And I remember that Miranda Green, in one description of the object, memory described how this sort of very stylistic, archaic representation simply of a, a, a human uh, face was a kind of divine shorthand or reduction to basically shun naturalism and you know, emphasize the supernatural qualities of whatever is being depicted here. This is one such subterranean shrine. There's another very interesting example which I find quite um, peculiar. Um, um, in the Ardennes, uh, at a place called um, Assi Rumos. Um, this is an earlier example, dating to the 7th century BC, but here, above ground, there was a rectangular timber shrine-like structure, and then within it, you had a, a deep shaft over seven meters deep, carefully cut, and its base was well above the water table, which has 50 meters below this again, and it clearly had a cultic purpose. Little was found in the shaft apart from some animal bones and pottery. But a group of burials were found nearby. And they were very strange indeed because they were all male burials in very peculiar contorted positions. Essentially, the corpses had been bent double and were cross-legged, as you see. And this prompted the excavators to make the intriguing suggestion that um, these sacrificial individuals had been placed in boxes in a process of desification in the shaft before being buried in this peculiar way uh, nearby. I think cult practices are an undeniable interpretation in this case and indeed in others. The mere fact that only males were treated in this way suggests something very strange is happening here. I think we should also remember that on a broader front, even the digging of a ditch like the great internal ditch at Ranari Antara, the Fort of the Kings, was probably yet another form of engagement uh, with the other world, just like wells and shafts and burial mounds. Mm. This ditch inside the external bank was a monstrous piece of uh, work. Um, it was cut right through rock to a maximum depth of almost uh, three meters and about seven meters wide. Obviously much, much larger than was necessary and of course it had no defensive role. This was a reversal of the usual defensive order ditch inside bank as I said. We saw this too at Navan Fort. It seems that the digging of, an, digging of an unnecessarily large ditch like this must have had a very special and peculiar significance. And I think at Ronnery this is reinforced by the remains found in it. The ditch fill, well, there's been very limited excavation taking place here, but it seems clear that in those limited excavations that um, deposition must have spanned several centuries. And a lot of animal bones, mature cattle, pig, sheep, or goat, horse, and dog were found. Human bones were uh, found as well, including skull fragments and the skeleton of an infant. And in the report, um, the animal bones were interpreted as food debris. 
And you hear this wearingly obvious sort of our functional explanation again and again, the remains of ceremonial feasts. This, I think, severely underestimates the significance of this material in this context. We know now, for example, that the name Tara, it's cognate with words like the Greek temenos, meaning sacred enclosure, and the Indo-European root tem uh, means to cut. The cutting of the great ditch must have been a profoundly important act, engaging with the underworld, the other world, sometime in the first century BC. And the presence of bones, be they human or butchered dogs and horses, may have had very particular uh, cultic significance. And in one instance, a horse bone showed evidence of roasting. And as we shall see, the discovery of horse bones in contexts like this may be of a special significance. Equine rituals of one sort or another will be the focus of the, the next lecture. It was a Greek writer who said uh, 2,000 years ago, the netherworld gods welcome trenches and ceremonies done in the hollow earth. We may be able to sort of perhaps detect whole narratives here. Uh, 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 another series of lectures could be devoted, of course, to hoard deposition in the Bronze Age, not just in Ireland, but in Britain and across Europe as well. Um, but just to illustrate that point, um, the narrative qualities of some uh, prehistoric Bronze Age hoards, the great Dowrys deposit in County Offaly in Ireland is, I think, still the largest Bronze Age um, collection ever found in Ireland. It seems originally to have comprised over 200 uh, items, including an exotic bucket, number one there, of Central European type. It was reclaimed in Bogland. Um, it was found in Bogland um, that had been reclaimed, but it, it was obviously the shore of a once larger lake uh, in past times. And in prehistory, it was probably a huge and extensive body of water, which if you, it's now long gone and replaced by forestry, but I imagine if you stood there and looked uh, northwards, from the site of the discovery, you would have had a lake that would have been on the fringes of a vast expanse of midland bog that stretched like a great dark blanket uh, to the horizon. Its liminal location on the interface between the wild and the tamed uh, must have invested Dowrys with very special meaning in the, the late Bronze Age. And, you know, the bog was a place shaped by non-human forces, and I'm sure it was that probability that demanded votive offerings from time to time. Now the term hoard was applied to the Dowrys uh, deposit because it was thought that this was, you know, a collection of bronzes all placed in this location more or less the, the one time. But you have a very interesting diverse uh, set of objects. Um, to dispose of a complete bucket or a cauldron that may once have been the centre of great ceremonial feasts must have been a very uh, special and s significant act. Its submergence in that ancient lake may have been part of a public ceremony, officiated perhaps by someone of you know, religious or political importance. But the deposition of a, a broken spear or a sword might have been a more private commemoration of a victorious combat event or the death of the, its warrior owner. You can see how perhaps the narrative can be constructed here. A woodworker's axe or gouge may have been a craftsman's tribute, and perhaps a scrap of bronze or a polishing stone might have been uh, the offering of a metal worker. Some poorly finished objects may have been even specially made uh, for deposition here at some point in the past, selected especially for ceremonial discarding. In fact, the diverse range of objects here and we should remember there may have been organic materials offered as well that simply did not survive. The range of objects probably denotes a hierarchy of participants and a protracted series of um, different sorts of performance, some communal in the hope of benefiting a social group and some of a much more uh, personal nature. This sort of hoard deposition is an extraordinary widespread practice both in the Bronze Age and the Iron Age. And 
Archaeologists, as we know, have used terms like votive offerings, ritual deposits, structured deposition, and indeed gifts to the gods, uh, all terms used to describe a variety of practices. Now, there are some um, who are sceptical about the gifts to the gods explanation, and I know at least one person who sees it simply as a, an interpretation that allows scholars to cope with what seems to be the irrational nature of metalwork deposition. And inevitably, it's difficult, if not impossible, to reconstruct what detailed form these practices took. But I think we are looking at practices that are essentially offerings to the other world, to a parallel world, perhaps a mirror world, uh, perhaps a land of the dead. It may not be, as I said already, uh, as elusive a world uh, as one might think. We've already seen how on the Trundhalm sun disk, on some other Bronze Age and Iron Age metalwork. This supernatural world where the sun went at night might be, in fact, um, a reversed world, the inverse of uh, this world. And here, I think, we get glimpses of a complex cosmology in Irish tradition that tells us that this other world was much, much more than just uh, a land of the dead. There's one peculiar find, actually, in County Roscommon um, that George o Ogan published a number of years ago from a place called Loch Nanain. He didn't mention the mythological associations of the, the discovery, which was made in the 19th century. He, he, he pointed out that um, this chain link bronze object was probably judging by the shape of the central pieces, something that was worn in ceremonial fashion over the shoulders of some uh, elite personage. And he compared it to various chain li link objects, some with bird and some symbols, uh, fairly common in, in Central Europe. But it is interesting to note uh, that this Loch Nain seems to be the lake referred to in the tale called The Adventures of Lyra. This individual visited Marmel, the Plain of Delights, uh, a name found in other tales, and a name sometimes given to the other world. His journey takes him beneath Loch Nain, which still exists in County Roscommon, as I said, the Lake of the Birds. And wonderful it was, um, travelling on every shower, leading an army of 100,000, going from kingdom to kingdom in the other world. Uh, he plays chess with yellow gold men on chessboards of white bronze. And perhaps understandably, he decides to stay there and has not come out yet. Obviously, the attraction, as you see, of fine plaintive fairy music, drinking mead with bright vessels and talking with the one you love was too much for this individual who remained there in this happy uh, other world. I, I, I think it must be more than a coincidence that this rather exceptional piece, modelled on Central European fashions, found its way into a body of water in Roscommon to be discovered around 1840. Uh, it's now in the, the National Museum. It would be foolish to imagine, however, that there's a unified concept of another world. And, but there are hints of uh, several recurring themes. Mounds, we know, were other world portals. The cave at Uina Goth was one, and Loch Nain shows that lakes uh, were another. Newgrange is recorded, too, as a, an entrance to the other world, and that is not surprising. Um, within Newgrange, in one tale, it is said that there are three trees there perpetually bearing fruit, and a never-living pig on the hoof, and a cooked pig, and a vessel with excellent liqueur. Eternal feasting seems to be one of the recurring themes in these tales. And when the legendary king, Khan of the Hundred Battles, who we'll encounter in another lecture, is transported to the other world, he's offered a large portion of meat by any standard. Ox rib and rib of boar. The ox rib was 24 feet long, and there were eight feet between its flank and the ground. This was obviously an exceptional feasting occasion. But, as I've already mentioned, this was also a land of the dead. Nera, you remember, um, entered uh, the cave at Crohan, and you will recall that much of the action there occurs at the Feast of Samhain. And you remember the phrase, um, the woman in the other world 
told him to bring the fruits of summer to the outer world outside so he could tell them he had been in the other world. Bring the fruits of summer with you, said the woman. So he brought wild garlic with him and primroses and buttercups. It's very interesting that this sort of otherworldly inversion that we've seen in, in, to some degree in the solar symbolism is also alluded to in the early 13th century history of the Danes of Saxo Grammaticus, where the king Hadingus is approached at supper by a woman bearing hemlock. And in inviting him to see what part of the world such fresh plants might grow in winter, she envelops him in her cloak and they vanish away beneath the earth. They both find themselves in a sunny otherworld region where such herbs grew. This inversion in references to the other world is something I think we can pursue uh, archaeologically. Um, we've seen it, as I said, in the solar imagery, particularly in the binary opposition of pairs of objects like the discs on the Petri crown and the Monaster Evan type, type discs are already mentioned. But it occurs elsewhere as well. In the very famous uh, Iron Age Hallstatt grave at Hochdorf, this individual, whom we'll visit again uh, later on, was buried with the highest status symbols of the elites of the early Iron Age. As you can see, he was placed on a wagon with various um, gold ornaments. But it's his shoes I simply want to focus on at uh, this stage. Um, the shoes had probably been of leather, but they had perished. But the gold mounts that had been placed on them survived. And it was very clear from the shape of the gold mounts that the right shoe had been placed on the left foot and vice versa. And the archaeologist Ulrich Weit noted how the inversion of grade, grave goods might indeed represent the passing of a person from this world to what he described as an upside down world. And Eugène von Ball too has remarked that it's unlikely that the placing of these shoes on the wrong feet was a mistake in this highly uh, ritualized context. And he draws attention to Hittite mythology, where the god of fertility and agriculture, Telepino, dis disappears in winter, having put his sandals on the wrong feet. Telepino undergoes a symbolic death and spends a time in the land of the dead, and this has a predictable negative effect on nature uh, until he's located and brought back to this world. And there may be a, an echo of this in some of the um, Slavonic um, folklore, where malevolent demon gods, spirits of the forest, the Leshi, they're particularly active in spring after dying in autumn like the leaves on the trees amongst which they lived. But their style of dress included clothing worn back to front and shoes worn on the wrong feet. Now, I must confess, there's a, a huge distance in every sense of the word between an ancient Anatolian myth, European uh, folklore on shoes, and indeed the fruits of summer uh, from Oena Goth. But I think we're beginning to see a pattern here. And there is an obvious difference, I suppose, between, between the wearing of shoes on the wrong feet and the wearing of just one shoe. But if you think about it, wearing one shoe and leaving one foot unshod is possibly another version of this uh, rite. And in medieval Ireland, um, as some will recall, royal inauguration ceremonies included the rite of the single shoe, in which a single shoe was a very emblematic item um, to toss or wave or place at one of these medieval inauguration ceremonies. And there are various references in Irish literature to other world figures associated with a single piece uh, of footwear. Uh, for example, there's one of the supernatural Tuatha de Danann, who alternated a golden sandal so that each of your feet had the turn of it. Another otherworldly figure recorded by Princess Makana also wore one golden sandal, one golden sandal, which as he walked was on whichever foot uh, touched the ground. Yet another wore a silver sandal and yet another wore a silver sandal on his left foot and a golden one on his right. There's something very peculiar uh, happening here. McConnell actually suggested that this 
motif may in some way be related to the Indian taboo that prohibited a king from treading on the ground, lest his potency be drained away into the earth. But in any event, in early Irish tradition, this peculiar notion of one shoe or alternating shoes or reverse shoes clearly carries um, supernatural associations. This um, uh, right of monosandalism, as some continental <laughs> scholars call it, um, is well known in classical literature and in classical art, and this is simply a sort of a replica of a statue of Mercury uh, shown with one foot uh, shod and one foot unshod. This is a French discovery, and it seems to be a depiction of Mercury in his role as the guide of souls, escorting the dead to the other world. And very often where you get depictions of this monosantalism, you are dealing with events uh, that seem to be marking some sort of transition in whatever um, depiction they occur. And this is just like the case of the Hochdorf body being prepared for his journey to the other world. It's interesting too at Hochdorf, by the way, that um, you remember I mentioned that Vix that the wagon bore this solar decoration in small bronze plaques where you had birds' heads above and below the solar disc. It's very hard to see on the um, Hochdorf um, couch on which the corpse rested, but ringed in red there at either end of the decorative panel, that's such a striking feature of the rear of this very strange object, you have small birds' heads. And even though these are miniature versions, I don't think for a moment we should underestimate their significance to those who engraved them and those who um, were aware of their uh, existence. A, a connection with birds and the other world is something we come across again and again. And indeed, you may recall we came across it in the very first lecture in that birth tale of Cúhollán when those birds ravaged the land around um, Awan Marka. Half a millennium earlier, you also find traces of this otherworldly inversion in a series of commemorative uh, stele in southwestern uh, Iberia. These are engraved with schematic motions, including stylized figures of warriors, as you can see. Swords, spears and chariots and circular shields uh, all occur. And it's very clear that uh, the shields are often shown from the rear. The boss isn't shown, but as you can clearly see on this example, the grip on the handle of the shield uh, is uh, visible and clearly depicted. Uh, Marian Uckelman, in her splendid study of European shields, sees this back to front view as one from a shield bearer's perspective and a means of expressing the protective purpose of these objects rather than their uh, offensive role. Thus the stone may have been a, a territorial marker presenting an offer of uh, protection and uh, safety. But I think there may be another and related meaning as well. The shield is reversed because the dead warrior presumably belongs to the other world and the occasional depiction of the sword on the warrior's right rather than on the left as you might expect in a right-handed person may be another uh, expression of this reversal. I think um, the fact that you have a, an otherworldly warrior represented reinforces the protective purpose of stones uh, such as these. It's interesting that some Hallstatt swords in male graves in France and Germany have also been found inverted on the body, the point towards the head, um, the hilt towards the feet. And such rites of reversal have been noted in several English Iron Age burials as well. The iron spines of some shields, for example, have been found placed downwards in the grave, suggesting an inversion. And indeed, in one of the famous Yorkshire graves at Kirkburn, uh, a coat of chain mail had been placed on the body of an individual buried in a chariot burial. It had been laid upside down uh, and back to front. And a warrior burial near that shrine at Mill Hill in Deal that I mentioned also contained uh, a man buried with shield and iron sword and the scabbard had been placed face down in an inverted position. I think careful scrutiny of other funerary evidence 
might provide us with more clues for a deeply rooted and widespread concept of an inverted other world. And it might even be reflected close to home in the widespread practice of inverting pottery vessels um, in Bronze Age burials. In uh, the National Museum of Scotland, they have a fine display of a number of urns, all placed in the display cabinet, as they should be, upside down in an inverted position. In many graves in Ireland, England, Scotland and Wales, and indeed even in some late Bronze Age burials in continental Europe too, you have this repetitive inversion of pottery vessels, sometimes containing cremated bone, but sometimes not, simply placed upside down in the grave. Now we have to be cautious here because ethnographic evidence does remind us how difficult the interpretation of um, burial evidence uh, can be. I remember many years ago Peter Ucko once memorably pointed out that one West African tradition neatly illustrates the sort of difficulties confronting the archaeologist. Among the Ashanti, custom ordained that the buried corpse should not face the village. In other words, the corpse sh should face away. And I remember thinking when I first read this, this is great. If we could draw a line from the head of the corpse outwards, we might eventually locate the settlements in which the individual had once lived. But unfortunately, as Oko pointed out, a minority of the Ashanti believed that the dead turned over in the grave. And consequently, to compensate for this post-mortem revolution, they bury their dead in the contrary fashion. So the interpretation of burial evidence is a tricky business, as you can see. But I think this repeated pattern of reversal or inversion uh, is worth considering as a, a reflection of a belief in an inverted other world. And finally, we should be alert perhaps to the fact, and I'm a little more tentative about this, that the journey to an inverted other world might conceivably be reflected in grave architecture uh, as well. This suggestion was prompted by um, the fact that a number of pre-Christian migration period graves at Silta, north of Stockholm, um, were carefully covered with stone packing. And this packing was carefully laid in a counter-clockwise direction, the reversal of the norm as you know, and like reversed footwear, perhaps uh, an allusion to the other world. You remember that the unfortunate Boand went counterclockwise around the well of Necton. And this sort of anti-clockwise construction, as noted in the Silta packing, may conceivably occur elsewhere as well. As I said, I'm rather tentative about this, but one Bronze Age kist grave from County Roscommon had its stones placed, as the discoverer pointed out, in cyclical fashion. Now there could be simple constructional explanations for this, but in most cases when these graves have been examined, it, it has either not been done or it has, been, has not been possible to do to determine the sequence in which the stones were laid. But if they were cons consistently laid in a counterclockwise fashion, then perhaps grave architecture, as I said, might be referencing the other world as well. In a, a discussion of the, the Silta phenomenon, um, a, a Swedish scholar, Andreas Nordberg, drew a, an interesting connection between some funerary practices and the need to perform some actions backwards, upside down, are contrary to the course of the sun. And as I said, remember the unfortunate goddess Boand. Nordberg reminds us that death too was a, a, a cosmic drama, uh, altering human existence in you know, fundamental ways. And he instances, uh, and I think this is uh, quite fascinating, a scene in one of those very famous um, Gotland uh, picture stones, in which, as you can see, Odin's eight-legged horse, Schleppnir, is carrying a fallen warrior on his back uh, to Valhalla. But behind uh, Odin's horse, there's a procession of three men walking backwards and carrying their swords inverted uh, with the points uh, facing downwards. And I wonder, could it be um, that some of the footprints and processional scenes in Bronze Age Scandinavian rock art, for example, are not meant to represent people walking forward, 
of people uh, walking backwards. You can see how, in fact, Irish tradition allows us to think, I think, in slightly different ways about many archaeological things. And while the darker aspects of the other world and the malevolent creatures are um, very much a part of the, the Uine Goth story, um, a belief in a very different, inverted other world was very prominent too. Um, one great Celtic scholar, Theo Ferrari, once said that the other world is impervious to archaeological exploration. And he was very critical of archaeologists who, as he put it, were by nature optimists and were tempted to wander into um, unfamiliar fields. Now, I grant you that the other world, by definition, has no material existence. But there were those for whom it was a reality. And I think archaeology does have the capability to identify some past processes and practices that have left us some material evidence, as you can see, of a belief that was probably a very fluid concept, but in some respects represented an inverted mirror world. Um, and like that belief in the celestial and nocturnal voice of the sun, we may have an illustration here of another very ancient European concept. And solar imagery, grave goods and grave architecture may suggest that this un inverted other world is not beyond our ken, archaeologically speaking. And of course, this archaeological world was also populated by supernatural beings. And we've already encountered the Dagda and Angus and the goddess Boan. Now in the next lecture, we will meet Macha, the horse goddess, who escapes from her otherworldly lair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.